Welcome back again to the Bad Quaker Podcast, where liberty is our mission. Today is Tuesday, April 16th, 2013. This is podcast number 302, and my name is Ben Stone. And on the line with me, on Skype actually, is Stefan Kinsella. Uh, if you don't know, Stefan is an author and a practicing attorney with Kinsella Law Group. Uh, Stefan, that, that was, uh, first off, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Ben. And uh, that must have been quite the random coincidence to get hired by uh, Kinsella Law Group, considering that's your last name. That's a wild coincidence. Yeah, and uh, I'm just tall enough so that my feet just reach the ground, too. So it's <laughs> amazing coincidence. My height is just right for my feet to hit the ground. <laughs> um, before we uh, really get into the meat and potatoes of today's um, podcast, I wanted to mention that uh, there's, this is completely off of our main topic and, I, and I'm throwing this at, uh, for the listeners, I'm throwing this at Stefan without uh, uh, warning him ahead of time. But, uh, St- Stefan, you're a good friend of uh, Jeffrey Tucker's, who I, a person I really like a lot. And I, and I find that interesting because, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Jeffrey is a very devout Catholic Christian, and yes. you are not. Well, I was reared Catholic, and so I know a lot about it, but uh, I would not call myself a... Uh a religious uh, person in that sense, no. But no, I think we all have our own interests and beliefs. I mean, look, we're not only libertarians, so right. uh, it's never surprising to me that people I'm interested in and close to have some ideas uh, that are different than mine or interests that are different than mine. Would you consider yourself a uh, skeptic or uh, atheist or agnostic, or how would you classify yourself? Oh, I'd say since... Uh, I was 14 or 15 years old. I've been a pretty hardcore, outright atheist. And I, I really, and that's really the, I, actually I knew that, that was a baited question, but, um, uh, and that's really the part that stuns me because Jeffrey is such a, a devout uh, Catholic and you are what might be considered a devout atheist and yet we, all of us together, and uh, you know me as a, label myself as a bad Quaker, um, we're all pretty much walking arm in arm in the same direction with the same goals. And it, uh, you know, there's so many anarchists that believe that if you're not this or if you're not that, then you're not fighting with them. But, uh, but here's three very wide spectrums of the, uh, uh, of the battle that, you know, we're still moving in, in essentially the same direction. Well, I think we all care about truth. And liberty, and we understand that liberty and a free society um, is a good thing, independent of the reasons we believe that. Although I think they're they're similar, but it it provides a framework that allows us to all you know have our own interests within that framework. So that's not a bad thing. That's actually a good thing. And I'm not hostile to religion, and I'm not anti. I wouldn't say I'm anti theist or even anti Christian or anti Catholic. I'm just not persuaded by their positive claims. Let's put it that way. Now, uh, let's get to uh, the real reason that I wanted to have you on. Um, Your book, Against Intellectual Property, is less than 60 pages. Of that, uh, probably, um, just a wild wild guess, maybe 20% of it is footnotes and references and so forth. So literally, a person can take this book, and you can buy it if you want. It's on Amazon or it's over at Mises.com, but you can also get the download of it for free. So, so we've taken away every possible excuse not to get your hands on this book. <laughs> and that's right. Um, it so clearly and simply lays out. Uh, first off, you you do a, a wonderful thing in your book. You you define terms. And I think this is where the failure of almost everybody I've spoke with about IP. Uh, almost everyone I've spoke with has no clue of the terminology that they're, that they're using. Yeah. 
And most people that I deal with don't really even know what the actual laws are involving IP. Right. And they have this imagined thing in their mind that they believe what, what IP really is. And you yeah. just hit right to the heart in your book and you just clarify it all and you say, look, this is what it is. And then you make your argument. I think that it's just for such a small little book, it's just an absolute, almost a, almost a work of art. It's so beautiful. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. I, I wrote it in a fit of passion um, coming from a law review background where we have a very analytical sort of framework for the way we lay articles out, but also from an Austrian anarchist and libertarian perspective as well where I thought, you know, this is not my favorite issue. I actually was a patent attorney at the time, and I still am, But it, which is why I started saying I've got to write something about this because everything I read is so mangled, you know. Um, it's still not my biggest interest, although it's dovetailed into a lot of other areas. But I still prefer myself as my personal interest, uh, uh, rights theory and epistemology and economics and you know that kind of stuff. Um, but this does tie into it, and you have to get this issue straight. Um, but as for definitions, yeah, I don't think we want to be too picky about things and pick on people for using the right wrong words. And I've never tried to say that if you're not some IP law expert, you don't have the right to have an opinion on this issue. I hate credentialism. I hate this sort of um, uh, situation where um, the people that are, are the guard, you know, the, 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 the guardians of the gate, you know, they, they can say who's got the right to have an opinion on this. Look, you have a perfect right to have your own opinion on this, but when you start making positive claims about these very complicated areas and you really mix them up, you mangle them, uh, you don't really know what you're actually claiming. Um, so, yeah, I think if you're going to be in favor, if you're going to oppose the abolition of patent and copyright and trademark law, let's say, then you should at least know what they are if you're going to oppose it. Right? So, you shouldn't be mangling patent and copyright. Um, and this gets to another issue that I've been increasingly focusing on, which is uh, th the necessity for being very clear in our terms. Even if you're of total goodwill and you have the best of intentions, if you're not clear in your definitions, you're going to be led astray. You're going to engage in unintentional equivocation or something like that. So when we talk about property, when we talk about uh, uh, intellectual property, we talk about justice, we talk about law, we need to be clear on wh what exactly we're talking about. And um, I mean, just as an example, someone will say something very sloppy like, well, are you saying intellectual property doesn't exist? And that's not the argument. The argument is not that intellectual property doesn't exist. I mean, I mean if you define the term intellectual property to mean a legal system that includes patent and copyright, it does exist. I mean, you know, during in 1820, slavery existed. So the question is not does it exist. So we need to we need to be clear whether we're asking a moral question or a factual question. So like, is it illegal to sell cocaine in America? Yes. Should it be illegal to sell cocaine in America? No. So we have a clear distinction between should and facts, between the descriptive and the prescriptive realms. So if we keep clear what we're talking about, I mean, because if you tell some libertarians, you know, you're actually a slave to the system because you have to pay taxes and you can be conscripted or you can go to jail if you sell marijuana or cocaine. They will bristle at that because they have such a natural law mentality that they think that by using these words you're sort of defining reality. You know, they think that you're they think that you're justifying it. But I think we can, as libertarians, be open and honest and recognize what the system is, and then we can we can judge it as good or bad, and then we can hold up our ideal model that we want to compare it to. I was having a discussion with someone not, not all that long ago, and uh, the discussion was about a, a person who was accused of a, of a pretty bad crime, and it looked like, you know, from all outside evidence, it, it appeared uh, that this person was guilty, and they were going to be going through the so-called criminal justice system. And my comment was in reference to there's no possible way – we call this criminal justice, but there's no possible way that actual justice can take place in this person's case. Uh, whether they're guilty or not is not even the point. There's no possible way that actual justice can take place. And the person I was speaking to was a libertarian, but 
um, but they were extremely offended because they took that to mean that I felt this sh- person should just be allowed to walk away. Right, right. And right. I, I tried to clarify it. No, let's talk about what justice is. Right. If a person does something you feel is wrong, they, they have harmed another human being, you have a natural desire for justice. But is justice defined as the government comes, picks this person up, the government charges you and me to haul them in, keep them captive for a certain period of time, while they capture another 12 people and force them essentially at gunpoint to, to be slaves for a time period while they listen to this case. And then the judge who is paid by the state and the police who are paid by the state and the prosecutor that's paid by the state and in all likelihood the defense attorney who's paid by the state are all going to argue back and forth. And if they decide that this person is guilty, then they're going to incarcerate him at your expense and at my expense. Well, he essentially does nothing. I mean, you know, he, and then at some point they're going to either kill him or turn him loose. How is that defined as justice? And and I tried to use exactly what you're saying there about defining terms. I tried to use that point to show that when we throw out a word like justice, you might have an idea in your mind of what that means, but that doesn't really mean that's what that means. Well, this is an example of the state co-opting things, right? The state co-ops and takes over institutions and practices in society that have a natural basis like like roads, like law, like language – even like language, right? Um, communications, um, and and then people start associating these things with the state. So it's almost inconceivable to people that you could have roads without the state. It's almost inconceivable to people that you could have justice or law or even quote unquote government, which really just means governing institutions of society, law, law and order, or something like that. So if you say you're opposed to the state, they think you're opposed to the government or to government. They think you're opposed to law. They think you're opposed to justice. They think you're opposed to roads because they associate these things with the state. So I believe the state has done such a good job of corrupting even people that are on our side that they have become essentially um, legally legal positivists. That is, they they believe of law as the commands that emanate from some authorized sovereign. Okay. And they sort of bristle against that in an intuitive sense because they're libertarians, but they still are thinking of law as emanating from a sovereign. Okay, And so the problem is that when you start using words and you try to distinguish the meanings, they have this – they have they have a disconnect. They can't grasp it. They can't grasp that you're against the state and yet you're for government in the in the in the justice sense, right? They can't grasp that you're for law and order. And yet you're against the state because they see those these things as so inextricably bound up. So it, it's a challenge, but it's a challenge because the state has succeeded in dominating even the language and the whole conversation um, about this. And look, I mean I get criticized from people that are really less radical than I am in a sense. I'm an anarchist, total IP abolitionist, you know, free thinker. <laughs> and I'll hear someone saying well, why do you use the state's words intellectual property then? I was like, well, because I have to communicate with people. So every time I do it, I have an implicit asterisk, and I say, just because I'm admitting that the government treats this as a property right doesn't mean that I am agreeing that it's legitimate or justified. Just like if I admitted that someone was a slave during the antebellum uh, South or U.S. doesn't mean that I'm admitting that they should be a slave. I mean, we can recognize reality and criticize it without endorsing it. I, I think you've hit on something else here that's really uh, important, and it's something I learned from uh, Robert Higgs. Uh, I was talking to Robert Higgs one time, and, and we were talking about the inefficiencies of government. And he said, keep in mind that you know you think of things like the law and, and roads and, and all these things that people – and security. People think this is what government's job is. But in, and, and it's horrible at all those things. Everything, it seems like everything the government does, it fouls it up. It makes it worse. But like Robert was telling me, um, you're missing what the real government, what the real job of the state is. And the job of the state is to empower itself and perpetuate right. its, its existence. And it does that with blinding uh, efficiency. Yes. The, the thing that the, that the state really does that it really cares about, if, if you can imagine care you know, in, into this uh, non-entity uh, of the state, 
the thing that it really thrives on, it does with blinding accuracy, and that's to perpetuate yes. itself. And stealing words is one of the yeah. things that it does. No, it's, it's like a disease. I mean, look, remember Harry Brown when he ran for president? His, his little message, his meme was, uh, the government just doesn't work. Now, I know what he's doing. He's trying to counter their propaganda that they use to, to put up this patina or veneer of legitimacy to justify their actions. But if you, if you discard the propaganda and you understand what the state really is, then the state does work. The state's very good at what it does. Um, and that's one question I've always had. I, I used to say the state is good at nothing except, except destruction. Okay, it's not good. It cannot create anything. It can only para, you know, be parasitical and destroy. Um, but then, well, then, then the question is, well, why would it even be good at destroying? Like, why would the army of the government be a good, you know, why would they good at, good at demolition? I mean, that's actually not an easy task. I mean, it's easier than creation. That's probably the reason. But I think there's another thing they're good at, and they're good at propaganda. Now, I don't know if they're good at propaganda because they just step into a society that's ready to receive this sort of message because everyone is sort of paternalistically minded and they're looking for some someone to fill the vacuum or because the state um, actually tricks them with government education and with the king's message that I'm going to protect you and be your father figure, etc., or maybe some combination of the two. So, so I would say the state is good at two things and uh, not to its credit, but the state is good at destruction. And the state is good at deceiving people as to its legitimacy. I think that's a really good way of putting it. Um, I was kind of, I don't want to uh, bring up, uh, you know, there's a, a phrase that kicks around the internet, a, po a pod beef, where one prominent uh, person takes on another prominent person and then it um, ends up getting kicked back and forth. And I don't want to turn this into something like that, but um, I, I was very disturbed at. Uh, um, oh, the guy's name escapes me. There's a prominent libertarian and an Austrian. That Robert Wenzel? Win yeah, 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 yeah. Bob Wenzel, yeah. yeah. Um, well, that's actually apparently not his name, but <laughs> that's one of his names, but, but go ahead. We'll respect oh. whatever, you know. <laughs> I did not know that. Yeah, it's apparently a pseudonym, but. Well, I, I was very disturbed that he takes the position that he takes um, with such gusto, uh, but it doesn't seem me just listening to him it doesn't seem he actually uh has thought through that position it, he he just throws out one series of attacks after the other without really even substantiating them and i and i almost couldn't resist having you on the phone i just couldn't resist saying how does a person think that way how do they not step back and analyze the argument they're making and say look i'm just appealing to authority over and over and over and if the person doesn't have respect to that authority it's a um, meaningless argument ben i don't know i mean i'm look i'm i'm sometimes blunt i'm a very um fierce guy and um uh, i try to be civil and polite but i'm also blunt and i'll be honest and i think actually it respects people to be honest with them and to tell them you know, if you ask me a blunt question, do you agree with me? I will say no if I don't. I mean, I'm not going to kick you out of my house or you know, throw water in your face. But I'll, So I think there's nothing wrong with having a blunt conversation sometimes mm -hmm. and being honest because it kind of cuts to the chase, reduces time. Um, I, you know, you've seen the phenomenon. People get to a certain age or they have a certain investment in certain ideas, and they just can't change their mind anymore. They're too invested in it. It would be too embarrassing, or they're making money off of it. I don't know. So Bob Wenzel and I, uh, or whatever his name is, we had a debate because he had been like this libertarian Austrian guy, and he just started getting popular and started kind of taking pot shots at Jeff Tucker and myself because of our, our IP um, criticisms. And he, you know… <laughs> You, I've gotten this a, a, a thousand times. I mean, he's one of just another one of a thousand people out there who just takes pot shots. But he claimed he was at a book in the works. He said this for three or four years. I don't think he's serious, but he, I finally I said, look, if you want to talk about it, I'll, I'll agree to have a debate with you. But the debate turned into a, it was just the debacle. It was just horrible. I mean, it, it was not civil. It wasn't reasonable. He didn't want to discuss ideas. So the question is, why didn't he want to discuss ideas? And I'm not assuming I'm right. I mean, because. You know, I was actually trying to discuss ideas, and if you can prove to me that I'm wrong, I'll listen. That's fine because I'm interested in truth and justice and what makes sense and what works. 
Um, but he was just taking pot shots, and I think he was just trying to get traffic for his site, or he just – he had been called on his uh, – uh, you know, he knew that he was going to be exposed for his boast that he was going to come out with a book proving IP, which was nonsense. I mean it's just nonsense if you read what he's writing. I mean look, I've seen everyone who knows anything about IP, and I know the two or three or four people – who have some semblance of an argument for IP, and they're trying to come up with it, and they're trying to make it work. And my prediction is they won't because that's what happened to me. I was trying to do this too for three or four years as a young lawyer, libertarian, patent lawyer, trying to find a way to justify my own career. That's why I got so interested in it, and finally I gave up, and I realized, oh, now I see why I keep running into roadblocks because there's something fundamentally incompatible with this. And the idea of private property rights and individual freedom and the free market and competition and the idea that you can compete with people and you can learn from people. And there's nothing wrong with spreading information or learning from other people. You know, And if you want to go onto the market and for whatever reason, whatever motivates you, if you think it's necessary to reveal to the public some information you know, by selling a new product that has a new feature or by selling a book, you know, then, then you think it's worth it. For whatever your personal reason is, to reveal this information to the world. Well, but once you reveal information to the world, you cannot expect people to not act on it, incorporate it into their brains and their minds. And you know what? You don't own their brains and their minds, and you don't own their property. So if they want to print copies of the new Harry Potter novel and compete with you, or if they want to sell a mousetrap that's similar to yours, hey, it's a free world. Get over it. Figure out a way to deal with it. Figure out a better business model if it doesn't work for you. So that's kind of my attitude, and um, why people can't adapt, I don't know, although I will tell you in a way I'm not a big promoter type. I'm not a big politician type, uh, po political, political activist type. Um, I believe in recognizing reality and realizing that in some ways we're kind of doomed. In some ways there's hope, but I do believe that um, like in the case of IP, i am actually been heartened by the fact that um, so many people have instantly or fairly quickly – Adapted to and learn from this from this i you know the IP idea. So I would focus on the fact that I don't know. Let's say seventy percent of all radical libertarians get get what we're saying. Some of them get it right away. They get it within a paragraph. They go, oh, I see. I've been misled all my life. So the fact that there's five or ten, fifteen percent people out there that are fighting this and they're maintaining, you know, the the old generation's mentality view about IP. Which is quasi statist or quasi pre pre internet age, you know, ideas is actually not that not that bad. I mean, I think we've made a lot of progress. So yeah, there's a few outliers out there. There's a few people. I think that as time passes, they're gonna the generations will wash them away. All the young people are with us. All the left libertarians are with us. All the uh, technical savvy libertarians are with us. All the Austrians are with us. All the anarchist libertarians are with us um, pretty much. So I think this is actually very encouraging and, and, and heartening. I, I think, uh, you know, when I was young, I was, uh, my dad was sort of a little uh, inventor and uh, a tinkerer. He was a, a basically a, a natural engineering genius. And he, when I was about, I guess I was about 14 or so, he. Uh, encountered a problem in uh, among certain orchards that were infested with a particular disease, and he just in his mind he saw the he saw the machine that could fix this problem, and so he went to the machine shop and and uh, spent probably oh I don't know maybe five or six months um, developing from scratch the machine that he saw in his mind when he, mm -hmm. when he first encountered the problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He got it all done, took it out to the fields and started testing it. And it worked flawlessly just like he had imagined in his mind. And, um, and we started making a lot of money very quickly because mm -hmm. his machine was the only way to kill this particular disease. The disease is called verticillium wilt is very common mm -hmm. in cotton, but, um, but it doesn't harm the cotton because uh, cotton is harvested very quickly. But in an orchard, it will kill trees. Um, so then we got a notice by a chemical company in uh, out of Michigan that a cease and desist order that uh, that he couldn't do this because years earlier 
they didn't they nobody had the machine to do this with my dad mm-hmm. invented the machine just mm-hmm. you know out of his brain mm-hmm. but they owned the uh, the rights to the process even though they didn't have a machine mm-hmm. to accomplish the process mm-hmm. so i'm like 14 or whatever it was and i thought this is stupid mm-hmm. and and even that young i realized mm-hmm. this is people who have and and see by them owning that and shutting my dad's machine down, it cost uh, farmers in the San Joaquin Valley hundreds of thousands of dollars as their fields, as their orchards died, and they could do nothing yep. about it. Yep. So, so not only did it kill the invention that my dad had created, and and you can say, well, you're twisted because you had, you know, you had the loss of money in the situation. Well, yeah, but still, I'm observing this and I'm seeing it. Not only did it kill the invention, my dad literally pushed it out behind the shed and let it rust to death. You know, um, well, that that's actually a, a, a heartbreaking and perfect example of. I mean, look, I, I get I get criticized. It's, it's amazing what I get criticized for. I, I am a principled property rights libertarian. I am for the right to engage in collusion with other competitors, even even if it's not efficient. So, you know, that's my principled lip approach to antitrust law, for example. Although I I understand the empirical arguments for it, but in IP. It's also property rights based, but but because almost everyone gives these u- utilitarian or empirical or wealth maximization arguments for IP, I try to say, listen, if that's your argument, you need to be aware of what's really going on because your argument is not, you know, it's not shown by the evidence. And you'll give examples like the one you just gave, which is needs to be written up probably i mean um but the point is so then let's say well now you're being a utilitarian it's like i'm not being a utilitarian i am just trying to talk to you on your own terms and to show you the actual consequences the human devastation that comes from these laws i mean you guys say that we need these laws because we need it to encourage innovation can you even show a single invention that was come up with because of the patent system and they they really never can but you can show many examples of inventions and innovations that are scuttled because of the patent system, like your father's. And it's probably heartbreak. Now, look, I don't blame people for using the patent system. I mean, look, if your dad, if you had told me your dad filed for a patent on it and you had to use it, this is the system we're in. I mean, I that's a more of a practical or moral, moral or tactical question. How do you live a life in a society that's not perfect? I mean, I, I drive on the roads. You know, I probably will get social security payments someday, etc. None of that. None of that means the government should own the roads or that there should be a social security system. You know, just because of the actions of a given person. Um, but no, it's it's horrific. And if you can point to some examples of clear, clear violations of property rights wrought by the patent system, like in the case you just described. The the problem that I I see, Ben, is that when you talk to people that have these kind of ad hoc scattered views about IP, they never have a systematic approach to IP. The ones that do have a systematic approach to IP are virtually insane. Like they basically think IP is the only property that exists and it should last forever, like Galambos or maybe even Spooner in some some of his days and some of the Rand the Neo Randians. Um, if they had their way, then the world would cease to exist. I mean, we would all just literally die. There would be no innovation. We'd have – you'd have to get permission from everyone to perform anything you wanted to ever do in your life with your own property. Human life could not survive. The only reason they get away with these IP schemes is because they blunt the edges of it. So what's frustrating is when you talk to a fairly reasonable libertarian who has strong opinions about IP, even though they know almost nothing about it, which is what's frustrating. My, my view is you should kind of be – a little bit humble and a little bit tentative about this kind of stuff because it's obviously dangerous, and if you don't know a lot about it, at least have an open mind and reserve your judgment, right? So you you, you, you tell them an example like your father's example, and what's the obvious response? They'll say, oh, well, I'm not in favor of that. <laughs> in other words, you can mention one abuse after the other. I could give you 50 abuses or consequences of a patent or copyright system, and almost every libertarian who is allegedly pro-IP will say, oh, well, I'm not in favor of that. 
So everything you can mention that's a consequence of the system that's obviously unjust, they will just back – They'll we, in Louisiana, we say they'll crawfish. They'll back up and say, well, I'm not in favor of that. So finally you say, well, what in the hell are you in favor of? You tell me that you don't want to abolish the patent system, but you're not in favor of it because you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. What the hell is the baby? What's the good part that you're in favor of? And then the response is, well, I'm not an expert in IP. Don't ask me. So it's like, well, well, then what in the hell are you in favor of? Why do you oppose abolishing the obvious injustice of IP? And, and they don't even realize that if, if you could you know, pass an amendment to the Patent and Copyright Act tomorrow in Congress that would get rid of these outrages that they agree with you or outrages, it would basically neuter the whole system. It would go from like a 100% IP system to a, to a 2% IP system. And all the IP advocates, Monsanto's and the rec recording industry and the movie industry, would be going completely ballistic. And they would be calling these alleged IP supporters, friends of ours, who want to reform the system. They would call them you know, abolitionists. They would say, you're trying to get rid of the incentive to invent and create. So it's really frustrating. I almost would rather battle a, a hypocritical Hollywood mogul who doesn't even – pretend to have any morality behind their stance and we're trying to reconnect are we reconnected stefan yeah i'm here oh okay the uh skype dropped us for a moment there sorry uh I i'm just saying that in particular cases like your father's mm -hmm. there's no excuse for justifying that whatsoever the libertarian has to step back and pause and say I cannot support this. This is a clear outrage. It's a clear – I mean what's the purpose of libertarianism if, if it's not to make people's lives better and more free and more prosperous? And if you have a case like this where someone is – they're not harming anyone. They come up with something useful on their own you know, merit, and now their dreams are dashed and they're impoverished, or they're just complete waste. It's, it's a tragedy. It's horrible. We cannot support this as libertarians. Let me uh, break and save this file in case uh, Skype crashes on us again and come back right on the other side of our commercial break with more with uh, Stefan Kinsella. From June 17th through June 23rd of this year, the Free State Project will celebrate its 10th annual Porcupine Freedom Festival, Porkfest. My wife Cindy and I plan on attending, and Bad Quaker staff members Hannah and Matt are trying to raise enough money to attend, as they did last year. Considering fuel, campground fees, and Porkfest tickets, we estimate it will cost BadQuaker.com a little over $2,000 for Cindy and I to attend. For Matt and Hannah to attend, it should cost an additional $700. If you'd like to take part in sending the Bad Quaker crew to Porkfest 10, here's how you can do it. Go to BadQuaker.com. You can click on the Donate button on the right-hand side of the page. You can give us bitcoins with our bitcoin number located right below the Donate button. Or you can use our Amazon button to shop at Amazon. If you'd like to support BadQuaker.com on a regular basis, you can use the link to our forum and become a supporting member for only $4 a month or just $25 a year. Thanks, folks. Thanks for sticking with us through the break. Uh, ben Stone from BadQuaker.com with Stefan Kinsella. And, you know, what I was thinking of when you were talking a second ago was um, uh, Murray Rothbard made a statement about economics. You know, economics is called the, what is it, the, the dreary science or something like that. I can't remember what, he, what it's called. Dis, the, the dismal, dismal science. Yeah, 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 dismal science. M Murray said um, there, it, there's, no, there's nothing bad about being ignorant of economics there's no mm -hmm. there's no you know dishonor in that uh just don't have a solid concrete opinion about it if you don't know anything about it and i think that's the problem with ip is that so many people have uh have this solid opinion that they've created and they don't necessarily they haven't necessarily thought it through but like like you were saying a minute ago in one way or the other they've got something invested into it whether it's their own emotions or, you know, I was talking to a, a gaming software writer once, and he couldn't stop and analyze wh what he was saying because the only thing he could think of is, if I didn't have IP, people would copy my game, and I'd be broke. And I'm like, right. dude, they're copying your game one way or the other, and every time they right. copy it, it makes you more famous. Right. 
But well, he, yeah, I mean, we have piracy anyway, so it's like you can't stop it anyway. But, you know, the, the, the way I think – I think most people – look, most people are not libertarian, legal, or property theorists. So the, to the extent they are they're intelligent and they've thought about this a little bit, they, they sort of have an intuitive or a, or a rough understanding that there's, there's, there's no conflict between the practical and the moral, which is what Ayn Rand emphasized, right? I mean so they assume that – what makes sense in terms of incentives, like property incentives? I mean, we talk about the tragedy of the commons. Uh, you know, if the roads are publicly owned, people are going to th go th throw trash on the on the median, but you won't throw trash on your own front yard. Everyone understands the tragedy of the commons idea, so they understand incentives come from private property, but they also understand a sense of justice about it. So they sort of think they're linked, and I think they're right, but they don't have it all worked out. So they sort of assume what they've heard is that we have these property rights, which the government has come up with, like property rights in land and cars. Governments also come up with a system to protect property rights and ideas because we need to give people incentives to innovate or create or whatever. So they, they sort of just absorb this idea without thinking a lot about it into their background, and they blend it together with justice right? because they think that they're not… Separate. They think justice and practicality are, are combined or united or, or dovetailed together. And when you start saying that there's something unjust about X, Y, and Z, you upset the whole balance because they don't have a whole theory worked out. And now you're, you're basically telling them you've got to abandon what you previously counted on before. It's not as easy. It's not just some rule of thumb. You can't just count on what the government tells you about what property rights should exist. And you've got to make a choice now between justice and pragmatics or something like that, and they get all freaked out. And now they're like, I'm not a philosopher. I, I haven't read a lot in this area. I don't have time to go figure out whether I'm going to be in favor of results or do the empirical studies to figure out the results or whether I'm in favor of justice or what, that, what this all means. And I think they just rebel, and they just say… You know, screw it. You guys are trying to upset the natural order. You know, why can't you? Why can't you just be in favor of letting it be as it is? Let's let copy. Let's let authors have a copyright in their novel. Let's let people that make movies have a copyright in their movie. Let's let inventors have a copyright in their inventions. But let's have reasonable controls on abuses. Let's have a better fair use exception to copyright. Let's have. Um, um, the ability to challenge bad patents. Let's improve the quality of the patent office. Maybe we need to reduce the scope of software patents. Maybe we need to choke back on pat patent trolls. But the basic system we need to keep in place because we need to keep incentivizing innovation and creativity. So I think that's the approach. It's almost – I won't say it's an anti-intellectual approach. It's like an anti-intellectual approach – spawned by laziness, spawned by complacency. I mean these people are settled in their opinions. They know they can't figure out the right system because it takes a radical – you have to have a radical new approach to property, which is the Austrian anarchist approach to kind of have a good handle on this. And once you do, it's actually pretty easy. I think you can explain the IP case in about three sentences. I mean it's really easy, but it's mind-blowing to people that are just encrusted with these statist ideas. I really think you're on the right track there, and you know, in many ways, what you were describing is the is the way that a minarchist holds on to those last hopes of the state somehow doing good things. You know, w w sure, we need to reduce government down to this size. We need to, you know, get government down small enough that we can hold it in a box and make it make it obey this little paper that we've got. And 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 they 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 keep falling back on. It's almost a blind faith. Well, it is a blind faith that somehow uh, something that maybe they don't know about is so important that we have to continue having a state for it, at least a tiny little state that's the shape and size that they imagine in their mind. Um, but but really, they're just taking uh, – they're doing that rather than thinking it through, rather than facing the realities that you can't shrink this down to the size that you imagine because – Whatever size you imagine the state as being, when you get it down to the perfect size, it's still going to be trampling on somebody. And IP well, is not, that well, way. Well, well not only that. So I, I, what you mentioned earlier about the state's natural 
the state itself has the interest in perpetuating itself and being large, um, whether large or not, I don't know, but perpetuating itself. So the idea that if we can think of the right constitutional blueprint or model to make the Obamacare administered more efficiently or whatever, the state is not interested in that. That's not what they're doing. The state wants to control us. They want to keep control and keep their power, and they will say whatever they have to to keep keep their power, but they're not really interested in that. So I think there's a, a really close analogy between the sort of IP breakthrough and the, and the anarchist breakthrough. It's like the people that are minarchists, although I'm not saying that you have to be an anarchist to be anti-IP. I think even if you're a minarchist, you can understand why IP makes no sense. But still, I think that there comes in a libertarian's life moments when you have breakthroughs, and that is you finally give up the ghost on minarchy. And then there's you know you increase your understanding over time, and I think the same thing happens with IP. You go, oh, the whole thing is just completely bogus, just like the state. But it's a it's a breakthrough moment. I agree. And how you get people there, I don't know. That's a that's a, a, a interesting question. I th I think for me with IP, um, you know, I had that early experience that I mentioned uh, before, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then I didn't really think about it in any way that much for years and years and years. And then, uh, you know, about the time, and I think this was the case for a lot of people, about the time that the file sharing and Napster and all that thing, that kind of stuff started to come up, it brought it back to my attention that there there is something fundamentally wrong with the current system, and it's not right. it's not just a matter of tweaks. It's a matter of this thing is designed backwards from the very beginning, and, yes. I, and I got to thinking about it. Um, you know, I hate to I hate to fall back on this all the time, but I always go back to, you know, what would happen on an island with two guys, and now there's a third guy, and how would IP um, develop in a in a natural market setting without the uh, an aggressive government there to inflict it? And I can't. Um, and now we're stepping backwards. What ten or fifteen years? I couldn't imagine then how IP could develop in a natural market setting. It just I couldn't figure it out, and therefore I had to reject that it had any legitimacy. Right. Um, but I couldn't put that together in, you know, uh, in a in a practical argument until I read uh, against intellectual property, and then I was like, well, now I don't even have to think about it anymore. It's done for me. All I have to do is just point at this book and say, you know, go learn stuff and leave me alone. Right, right. <laughs> Well, you know, I'll say that uh, you know, even when I wrote the book in uh, I don't know, ninety nine two thousand, I was still thinking that maybe there are contractual mechanisms people come up with that would um, protect their you know their ideas and all this. Uh, so I sort of had a intuitive reflex, like you know, there should be a private way to do something. But my view now has totally changed. I've actually chose changed my whole attitude. I think we have to change our attitude about knowledge and competition. Um, there is nothing wrong with someone keeping information private. Nothing wrong. If you want to do that, that's fine. I wouldn't say information wants to be free. Um, you're not doing anything immoral. <laughs> it's maybe moral to do it. I don't know. But if you reveal information to the world. There is nothing whatsoever at all wrong with other people reverse engineering you, learning from you, copying you, competing with you, emulating you. The spread of knowledge is not a bad thing. It's actually what makes society what society is. I mean we would not have human history, human society, human culture without the accumulation of knowledge and techniques and scientific knowledge and amazing artworks and novels and paintings. You know the the the, the use of the use of a medium to ex, to convey feelings across the generations. This is what makes us an amazing thing in the universe. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. So when people say, for example, um, look, if you sent me your private manuscript by email tomorrow, Ben, and we have a private relationship. It would be immoral for me to just publish it because we have sort of a private agreement with each other. But let's say you published your first novel tomorrow on Amazon, and I get an EPUB of that. Now, is it actually wrong for me to 
send a copy of that EPUB to 10 of my friends. Now, some people would say, yeah, you shouldn't do it. It's, a, it's bad manners. Actually, my attitude now is I t completely disagree with that. I think there is absolutely nothing whatsoever wrong. And in fact, I think it's a good thing with spreading information. Unless you have some kind of private moral or contractual obligation with someone not to do it, then to spread information is what life is about. And we need to recognize this. And I think the way to do that is to recognize that the whole purpose of property rights arises because there are some things in the world that are not infinitely reproducible, that, that are exhaustible, that, that are scarce. These are the means of action. So for these things, you and I can't both use the same thing at the same time, or if I use it, I run out of it earlier. So I have to economize. I have to economize. I have to decide when I'm going to use it because if I use it now, I'm not going to have it later. If I use too much of it now, I'll have less left. This is why we come up with the concept of economic goods or scarce resources, things that you have to economize on. But luckily, we have other things that inform human action, that guide human action, which is knowledge. Knowledge we've accumulated from other people. We've learned from our teachers, from our family, from the, you know, the, the cultural inheritance of mankind. And so we have this body of knowledge we can draw upon. And believe me, it takes skill and knowledge just to know what knowledge to select from. I mean, you've got so much now to select from, it takes a little bit of knack, a knack or a skill or knowledge to know which one to, to ignore and which ones to use. But the knowledge is not exhausted when you use it. You, you consult upon it. Someone else can consult upon this knowledge at the same time. So property rights are for the scarce resources, the economizable goods. They're not for knowledge. So we should be, as libertarians, as maybe thick libertarians, we should be completely in favor, in my opinion, of the widespread copying, reproduction, storing, dissemination of ideas, emulation, competition, all of it. There's nothing immoral or bad whatsoever about it, to the contrary. Back in the days when I was in the aerospace industry, uh, and I would try to explain these ideas to my coworkers, uh, one of the things that one of the examples that I used, I said, "Do you remember back in school? You know, back in government school, uh, you would get in trouble if you looked over at your neighbor's paper and copied off of your neighbor." And right. you know, that, of course, everybody remembers that from school. That that's against the rules. You can't copy. That's cheating. You can't cheat. Yes. Yes. And, and I would say, okay, now here we are in business now, and um, all in, in the particular business, uh, like I say, I was in the aerospace industry and uh, in engineering, and um, everything we did was copying off of each other. You constantly looked over at, at your neighbor, you know, at the cubicle, at your neighbor's cubicle. What are you doing? What are you working on? You know, what, uh, what are your results of that test? What is going on? Because without copying each other's work, there would literally be no airplanes, period. There, there wouldn't be any, and, and especially not to the level that we have them today. Everything, all the knowledge that involves in the aerospace industry is gained by people copying each other's work. And that was something that I could show in an in industrial setting like that. And for so many people, you could just see the lights come on like, yes. you know, that's right. Cheating's not... Uh, you know, a copying off of your neighbor is not cheating. That's survival. That's that's how we figured out what berries are good and which ones kill you. I mean, you know, it's so it's so fundamental to human existence that yes, we should copy off of our neighbor. We should cheat if that's what you want to call cheating. Then we should cheat. We should all see what everybody else is doing because it'll save you work and it'll move us all ahead, uh, ad advancing civilization. No, absolutely, and uh, I mean I, the problem is people conflate two things here. They conflate plagiarism and cheating and lying and dishonesty with copying. I mean these are two different things. Of course we're all against dishonesty, and if you're going to uh, take a test at a school where you have an implicit contract to do your own work and to show what you, your mind can do on its own in a certain contextual setting, then you're breaking the rules and you're, you're being dishonest. But – being dishonest is actually not illegal. It's just immoral, and it's not the same as copyright infringement. And you, you will have the defenders of copyright 
say that, well, you're not against you're not for you're not for plagiarism, are you? And I'm like, well, I'm actually not for plagiarism, but I don't think plagiarism should be illegal as a general matter. But in any case, copyright infringement has almost nothing to do with plagiarism because in most cases, you guys want to put people in jail who have copied someone else's book or novel or, or movie or song, even though they didn't misrepresent that they, they they never lied. They never said they were the I mean they never said they were the author of it. Some guy that uploads the Wolverine movie doesn't say he wrote the movie. So there's no plagiarism whatsoever. So they're using an example that everyone agrees you shouldn't lie. And they're trying to they're trying to get you to buy in on this. You know, you shouldn't lie. You shouldn't be dishonest. And once you agree to that, they say, well, then you shouldn't be for copyright uh, in, uh, abolition. And I'm like, well, wait a second. But infringing someone's copyright does not involve lying. <laughs> there's no dishonesty. There's no plagiarism. So you have this is, again, the reason to have clear definitions and concepts. Plagiarism, dishonesty, cheating, lying, they all have a fairly, you know… Uh, coherent meaning, and they are not the same as copyright infringement. And if, if people understood the law, they would understand that. So yet they're in favor of this law even though – based upon the idea that they're against plagiarism, even though they wouldn't make plagiarism illegal if they had to. Right. So it's like a complete intellectual confusion and mess. Uh, Stefan, let's talk about your websites a little bit. Um, I know StefanKinsella.com is uh, your primary website, right? Yes. And then you – don't you also have Libertarian Papers? Isn't that yours as well? Yeah, I founded that journal in 2009, and that's at LibertarianPapers.org, and I'm the executive editor now, and uh, another guy is the man you know, daily editor on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, everything is linked from StephanKinsella.com, including my uh, my podcast, which is called Kinsella on Liberty, on, on which this will appear. Um, what? And what? You're going to copy this? Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to copy it. There will be two copies out there or two two times whatever. you know. Um, and then um, I have a, a site that's focused upon intellectual property and innovation issues because I didn't want to clunk up my site and other sites with – IP issues, and that's called C4SIF.org, Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom. So that site basically is in favor of policies and rights that promote innovation, technology, innovation, freedom of innovation, and so that basically means anti-IP. So that's my main sites. Um, I also blog at the Libertarian Standard, which is libertarianstandard.org. Com, I believe. I'm typing this out so I can put it in the show notes for later. Okay, I can I can text you or email you too if you need it. Um, now, uh, I I, hmm, I hesitate to bring this up. I, I think uh, some of the people in in the uh, liberty movement in general um, would be. I, I know that you've uh, done classes and stuff over at Mises. You've done several courses over there uh, over time. But I think uh, people need to um, invite you out to some of these events like uh, Porkfest and Liberty Forum and some of those. I don't know if they've approached you and asked you that already or if uh, somehow you've just not been on the list. But No, they, they do. They've been very gracious. Um, I, I think I know – well, let, let me take a stab at it. I think I know where you're heading. Look, I was um, – I was originally in the Randian stuff early in law school, and then I, of course, quickly grew beyond that. And then I became heavily involved with the Mises Institute, and I was heavily involved there for a good 15 years. And um, I think it's a great group, but um, lately what I've been doing is, you know, when the web has evolved and different blogs come up and different avenues for transmitting your ideas come out there like podcasts and – teaching platforms. Um, I've been experimenting, experimenting with different things. Plus, my career has changed, too. I'm, I'm now an uh, independent attorney uh, with my own law practice. So, you know, I'm just trying different things. So, um, I, I have been invited to many of these things, but given my just current career, I can only go to so many of them. 
I would love to go to all of them, but I just I'm fairly young and have a family, and you know there's just issues like that. So I've been to Libertopia, um, I've been to Property and Freedom Society in Turkey several times. I've been to Mises in Auburn many times, and other things. And hopefully some of the things uh, I'll be able to make it to as well. I just went to Nagadoches, Texas, about three weeks ago for what's called Liberty in the Pines, which is sponsored by the Koch Foundation and uh, Young Americans for Freedom. And that was a fun event. So Stephen Molyneux was there. Jeff Tucker was there. Other people were there. So I do as much as I can. I can't be traveling every two, three, four weeks because of just my personal you know, schedule. But I, yeah, I try to do as much as I can. I've been invited to Porkfest and the, uh, the other New Hampshire things before, but it's just a travel issue right now at this point. So hopefully this year or next year I can make it up there. It's it's mo- the reason I brought it up is mostly selfishness on my part because uh, you're one of a very small group of people. Uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe is another that I that I really um, I check every one of these different lists and say, are they going to be there? Is this guy going to be there? Is that guy going to be right. there? Jeffrey right. Tucker is another one, and um, you know that that's a big factor for me. Uh, I would uh, love to be able to, uh, you know, hear you live and 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 all that. So it's it's purely selfishness on my part that I want you to drop everything in your life and and uh, you know <laughs> show up in the places where I happen to be so that I can watch you. Well, you sound like a uh, an ex Randian, right? You're, you're not against selfishness. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I never really uh, bought on to that. I kind of uh, uh, is. Uh, when I I was um, I came in through uh, uh, um, uh, hmm what's it called Normal National Organization and Reform of Marijuana oh, Laws okay and mm-hmm. this was in the late seventies and that with mm-hmm. my father's experience with IP I had pretty much come to the conclusion that government was uh, was at least an evil and I wasn't convinced it was a necessary you know wow so that's how I came into adulthood. And then, uh, and then went from there. Uh, I didn't really get any intellectual background for any of my thoughts until I bumped into Rothbard, and and it was just like, yeah, that's. It turns out I'm not crazy. <laughs> you know, somebody else thinks this stuff too. Yeah, yeah. You, you you find a net. I mean, that's amazing. Marijuana and patents as the entree to libertarianism. That is, uh, I mean, there are so many paths into this. It's, that's incredible, though. Marijuana <laughs> and uh, and patents. Um, that's a unique, unique combination, put it that way. <laughs> and I should mention for my listeners, too, that uh, I don't partake in any illegal, uh, you know, any illegal drugs or anything like that. Currently, I haven't smoked marijuana in probably 30-some years. Uh, so that's not, you know, that's not my bag or whatever. But, uh, but well, I still... I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I mean, I'm, I personally, I'm not opposed to it, um, but I can't stand it. <laughs> so I'm I'm in favor of legalization, but I, I I used to think I wish they would legalize it so I could on occasion you know have it at the house or whatever. But now I'm thinking like you know what I just don't enjoy it. I'm sorry I don't like soot in my lungs. Yeah. But hey, people who do, no problem with it. Yeah. Well, that was that would be the same argument with heroin. There's just okay. So if a magic pill were taken tomorrow and we lived in a world where heroin was sold in drugstores like uh, you know out of a little machine where you drop in a quarter still wouldn't buy it wouldn't right, have any desire right. for it right right although I think if I had to choose between you know a joint and a heroin I think <laughs> you know <laughs> smoke a doobie you know <laughs> but either one you know whatever that's not my point my point is I think you could be a principled pro legalization libertarian without doing it for completely i won't say selfish reasons but for completely you know unprincipled reasons yeah well stefan i would really appreciate you coming on the show with me today giving me an hour of your time like this and uh you know we we i didn't bring it up but we did try this a couple months ago i was on the road with the uh, motorhome at the time and uh due to technical difficulties <laughs> we i completely failed to uh to be able to do this so i, I really appreciate the second shot at it and I do hope to see you in person sometime at some some event or something or other. I think we'll make it happen. And I appreciate the time, too, and I enjoyed it. Thanks a lot, Stefan. Thanks. And, folks, thanks for listening today. And remember to visit badquaker.com, where liberty is our mission. Thanks a lot, folks.